All right, everyone, let's get the show started. Welcome to our DevOps office hours. It's December 16th, 2020. My name is Eric Osterman, and I'll be leading the conversation. I'm the CEO and founder of Cloud Posse. We're a DevOps accelerator, and that means that we help companies own their infrastructure in record time by building it together with your team and then showing them the ropes. If that sounds interesting, head over to cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash quiz. Our call today is recorded. If you're tuning in from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. We host these calls every week. We'll automatically post a video recording of this session to our YouTube channel, as well as follow up with an email so that you can share it with your team. Today, we have a very special edition of office hours. We're going to be talking about tacos because who doesn't love tacos? I'm taco, the tacos that I'm talking about are the ones uh, doing Terraform collaboration and automation software the right way. These, uh, these companies are coming to us from around the world and have awesome products making it easier for teams to collaborate on Terraform automation. The companies I'm talking about are like HashiCorp, N0, Scalar and Spacelift. I invited them onto our show today because I really wanted everyone to better understand the value they're bringing to the equation and why we need them. But more importantly, why we should stop running Terraform the hard way. Many of us use Terraform in like a CI CD context, but if you're like us, you found that doing Terraform well is really hard. How do you manage credentials without giving up the farm? How do you provide approval steps? How do you implement policies without uh, you know, getting in the way of developers? And that's just a start. These companies have figured it out, but they each take their own approach. Now's your chance to learn how they're doing it. So before we start, I just wanted to lay some ground rules so we're fair to all the speakers here today. Uh, the format of the call is a little bit different. Each speaker is gonna get 10 minutes to present after which there's gonna be a hard stop. Uh, I'm gonna keep the time. We're gonna leave the last half hour or 45 minutes or so for questions. So please post your questions as they come up in the Office Hours Slack channel. If you post them in Zoom, we might miss them. Uh, and most importantly, just please, let's not interrupt the speakers so we give everybody a fair chance. So we're going to kick this off by starting with uh, Jake from uh, HashiCorp. Jake, Jake is the regional manager for solutions engineering at HashiCorp. I've known Jake for a really long time, and uh, he hangs out regularly here in the SweetOps uh, community and uh, the various uh, Los Angeles meetups. He has a deep background in IT operations, ranging from DevOps to support to consulting and pre-sales. Jake is going to talk about Terraform Cloud and some of the exciting things coming out of HashiCorp with their platform. And just a hint here, this uh, goes a little bit beyond the Terraform Cloud. Jake, you want to take it from here? Absolutely, Eric. Thanks. Are you going to share your screen by any chance? Yeah, or? absolutely. Right. I'll, I'll share it. Cool. I'll stop sharing here and you can uh, take over. Outstanding. So uh, let me find the screen that actually works here. I don't know if I have the, uh, the right one. Sorry. Uh, why can't I see that? Sorry, about that. we didn't make the sacrifices today, so the demo <laughs> god might be uh, less easy on us. No, actually, well, hold on, just say because when I shared, I have my presenter view, and it's not uh, it's not allowing me to actually share out that one. Let's try this one. Okay, how's that looking? That looks good. I got it. Sweet. Yeah. So sorry, everybody. It's going to be slide where uh, 10 minutes is a little bit short of time to uh, to do a, a, to do a demo. Uh, as it, as uh, Eric mentioned, I'm Jake Lundberg, regional manager for uh, for solutions engineering here. Fancy word for sales. Uh, I've been here for about three years. Uh, I love uh, I love beer and I play some games from time to time. So uh, for those of you not familiar with HashiCorp, hopefully you are if you're here at this thing. Um, we are a uh, cloud automation company uh, focusing mostly on uh, provision securing, connecting, and running applications in the cloud. Some of the products uh, that we have, uh, before I came here, I wasn't familiar with the fact that we actually made all these things. Once I found that out, I came here. So Terraform's one of those. Uh, we also uh, create Vault, Boundary, Console, Nomad, Waypoint, Vag Vagrant, and Packer, so a very large- I, I hate to interrupt you, but does everybody else see the full the Jake slides? I only see half his screen. Did I, uh, let's, let, let's try it again. Sorry, I moved my window, of course. Uh, let's try this again. How's that? 
that yeah you're good now okay good sorry about that um cool company was founded in 2012 by our man get dadgar ha and mitchell hashimoto we're about a thousand employees right now um and trending upwards and we've got about 350 million dollars in funding uh, we're here to talk about Terraform. So um, Terraform is an infrastructure provisioning tool. Um, and again, we're all here talking about Terraform, so I'd be surprised if folks uh, weren't familiar with that. The vast majority of our customers are using it for cloud-based provisioning, but there are tons of providers, 300 plus that are out there. And uh, we get about 100,000 uh, weekly downloads and we've got 30,000 members worldwide um, who, uh, who use Terraform as a software platform. Uh, the main aim of Terraform, of course, is infrastructure as code, um, allowing you to abstract um, the infrastructure provisioning into one um, common language. So again, the provider model is helping with uh, with that. It's a declarative um, Turing complete language, and uh, and it's used all over the world for uh, for cloud based provisioning. The strength of Terraform, of course, is the fact that uh, you can provision everything. The cloud providers are also are, are very popular, but um, you can, you know, any kind of SaaS based solution that has an API, um, you can create a Terraform provider for that. And we see uh, lots of different examples that are out there. Um, some of them are uh, supported by HashiCorp, but the community um, also supports quite a bit of these that are out there. Um, and there's probably folks on this call who've created um, providers for uh, for Terraform. Uh, this slide actually is uh, uh, a little bit further about the education and dedication to the community that we have out there. So just some links that um, we find that are very helpful for people who are new uh, to the product. So uh, getting started with Terraform Cloud um, has a tremendous amount of resources that are out there. Uh, we also do a lot of free training. So hands-on training um, on our Instruct platform. Well, it's, uh, Instruct is a, is a, is a third-party platform. Um, so if you're uh, new to Terraform and new to Terraform Cloud, uh, we do regular interval events. Um, they're free events. Um, please join those if you want to learn how to uh, migrate from doing open source uh, to Terraform type cloud patterns. And uh, for those of you who um, are looking at Sentinel for policy management, uh, we have a very, very large library of uh, common uh, infrastructure pattern of uh, policy management that we have that's out there under the policy library. And I can share this slide out um, with your folks later, uh, Eric, if, uh, if that's helpful for everybody. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, great. So uh, why Terraform Cloud? Uh, Terraform Cloud is a fully managed infrastructure as code uh, platform that uh, is really aimed at, uh, at taking your Terraform to the next level by adding in uh, cloud compliance and management. Uh, allowing for self-service infrastructure for um, mostly through API management of, uh, of any of your Terraform environments. Um, again, the vast majority of the reason for Terraform Cloud is really to enable um, enterprise level, uh, sort of enterprise grade um, Terraform usage, but there are also uh, free versions of the software um, that are out there. We um, are SOC 2, Type 2 compliant, as well as ISO 27001. I'm not sure if that's the right way to, to, uh, to describe that. Okay, so what does Terraform Cloud allow you? Uh, the fundamental sort of work uh, unit of Terraform Cloud is a workspace, um, slightly different than the uh, OS, uh, OSS versions of this, but um, uh, state management, uh, fine-grained access control through RBAC management, um, secure variables uh, backed by Vault. And in, in fact, Vault was actually created um, for the, the previous version of Terraform Cloud that was called Atlas um, to secure credentials inside of there. And now it's one of the main products uh, that HashiCorp creates. Uh, each workspaces allow you to do notifications through emails, webhooks, and Slack, and uh, has a very flexible um, model for how to integrate. So uh, if you have VCS-driven workflows where you don't use the GUI um, or don't use CLI calls, uh, you can use VCS-driven calls. If you're used to using CLI-driven calls, um, you, those patterns can still exist when using uh, Terraform Enterprise. And then, of course, API-driven. So if you want to need to integrate this into existing CI/CD pipelines uh, or any any other kind of API management systems, uh, you know, like ServiceNow or uh, other um, sort of ITSM platforms. Well, probably uh, definitely not least of these uh, issues is that Terraform has its own provider uh, for TFC, so you can provision Terraform uh, Enterprise or Terraform Cloud with Terraform. Infrastructure state, obviously state management is a uh, major concern. So if you're using like an S3 Dynamo pattern or something along those lines for doing state sharing, most of that goes away. Um, state management is free with, uh, with Terraform Cloud at the, uh, at the lower levels. 
VCS connectivity, so the major uh, uh, VCS providers like Azure DevOps, Bitbucket, GitHub, and GitLab are supported. Uh, but because we have API-driven uh, access into Terraform Cloud, if you have to ha happen to have a, um, a an off-brand uh, VCS system, uh, you can integrate those in as well. These are just the automated ways of doing uh, more like GitOps type flows uh, for, uh, for operations. Four minutes. Okay, team management. Um, so any kind of RBAC controls that you'd have and you'd expect inside your systems, as well uh, as um, oh, I, I have the uh, single sign-on information that we have inside of here as well. Ooh, that's got a graphic inside of there. Uh, Terraform Cloud also has cost estimation to give you kind of street price of any of the cloud assets that you might be um, uh, using. Policy is code engine, so uh, Sentinel is uh, a little bit different than OPA, but is uh, um, a policy is code engine that uh, was created by HashiCorp specifically for use within our products, including Vault, uh, Console, and Nomad. Uh, run triggers is a way of actually linking workspaces together. So if you have um, state in one file that affects uh, workspaces in other ways, you can actually trigger any kind of runs from there. Uh, the private module registry, um, folks uh, like Cloud Posse have stuff in the public module registry, but if you have a need to share those within your organization, there's a private module registry as well. Configuration designer is a way of uh, basically bootstrapping things from the private module registry into higher level abstractions of your, of your Terraform modules. And then uh, any of the remote operations. So for folks um, that are looking for things like global variables, typically for um, cloud-based operations, we now have remote agents that can run inside of your data centers and run inside of other clouds and maybe forgo the need of actually having to use cloud-based um, uh, credentials embedded inside of your workspaces themselves. Very powerful pattern, um, especially for folks who have on-premise resources that they need to manage from the cloud. And we also have fixed IPs for Terraform Cloud services. So if you have a different uh, security model in which you need to allow Terraform Cloud uh, to operate on on-premise. Scale, uh, run concurrency, so if you need to do lots of Terraform runs at once. And then uh, very detailed audit logs into other systems, uh, Splunk being one of the more popular systems there. Okay, uh, there's a comparison package online that'll tell you the different features of which you get uh, from free to all the way to the Terraform uh, business class tier and uh, single cloud provisioning. Um, why HashiCorp? Uh, well, we created Terraform. That's a, that's a great reason that's out there. And um, we have a very large dedicated engineering team and we have um, a feedback loop program uh, from our field uh, customers back into the engineering teams. Uh, this year we shipped 30, 34 new features alone. Um, we still have the rest of the month that goes here. We have follow the sun support. Um, and uh, we have multi-product customers. So if you're using Vault, um, Console, or Nomad, probably there. Um, probably more importantly, I think, is that uh, you know, HashiCorp is a scale-driven uh, company first. Armand and uh, uh, Mitchell uh, met each other working on large-scale distributed computing problems. Uh, that ethos uh, carries into our products. So uh, 2 million container challenge for Nomad, uh, the uh, 35,000 nodes of uh, support for Console, that same thing comes into our operations for uh, for Terraform Cloud as well. Um, again, we're very, very dedicated One minute. to scale and security. And then uh, sort of an ex you know, sort of example of what this looks like. Terraform Cloud currently on boards about 5,500 uh, 5, new users per month. We do about half a million runs and we've got over 2 million managed state files. And this is growing, of course, on a month to month basis. So some of the customers that we enjoy uh, that talk about this publicly, some of these are mine. Hulu is, uh, is in our patch. We work with them very, very closely. Roblox as well. Uh, and that's it. Uh, lastly, we're hiring. Um, so uh, I, it's my favorite company to work for so far. If uh, you're interested, love our products, uh, please come work with us. Uh, we, uh, we enjoy um, the, uh, the community that we have here. And 10 minutes. All right. Thanks, Eric. That's, uh, that's all from the HashiCorp side. Thanks, everybody. That was a really intense, really awesome presentation. Thank you, uh, Jake, for uh, for uh, you know getting us started on that path. So uh, next up, we got uh, let's see here. We got Ohad. He's the CEO of Env Zero. He's going to give a quick live demo, uh, obviously within the ten minutes, and showcase what makes Env Zero special. Plus, I think he might have a special announcement uh, that will make somebody very excited. So Ohad, are you uh, ready to uh, present? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Awesome. Uh, and you already said that we have an announcement. So yeah, I want to I wanna start with uh, uh, showing our uh, new announcement. Do you see my screen, everybody? 
Yeah, we see it. Yeah, so N of zero, unlike HashiCorp, we are not uh, advocates of Terraform. We acknowledge that Terraform is now the de facto standard for infrastructure as code, but we, we're taking a multi-framework approach. We just added support for Terra Grant in parallel to Terraform, and we plan next year to add a few more icons here. It might be Pulumi, it might be CloudFormation, it might be others, but all in all, we aim to support our customers in any technology uh, that they, they prefer. So uh, feel free to use us for Terragant as well. I wanna explain about uh, N0. And the concept in N0 is that you have two types of users. You have the admins, the platform team, the DevOps team, and you have the others, mainly the developers, but anybody who needs to update and provision cloud resources at N0 has a hierarchy of few entities. We have the global organization, and then we have the projects. Each project is a logical entity that combines users, Git repo, permissions, cloud, uh, cloud accounts, and policies in one entity called the project. And we see for our customers usually that they have different projects for different types of usages in their cloud, uh, cloud accounts. So we see usually a project for production, a project for dev staging environments, and a project that I think we, we put a lot of focus on this DNA, which is the on-demand ephemeral developer per pull request environment. So let's start looking at those. So each project, even if it's for production or for on-demand environments, has variables that basically connects you to the cloud account and any other settings that you want. And those are sensitive and hidden. And then the admin can define uh, who can do what in uh, which privileges. So we have the viewer for the CFO or product managers that can look at cloud resources and their cost. Planner, it's for the approval flow and like a developer in production that can change some variable value, but another person, a colleague needs to approve it. So that's the deployer that can actually deploy cloud resources. So DevOps in production or developers in non-production are developers. And admin is the group manager that can decide who can do what. And what is the what? The what is a catalog of a Terra Grant or Terraform based Git repos that uh, already exists in the you know, source control of the customer. But in addition to Terraform or Terragant, we have a unique concept of custom flow. If you add N0 YAML to your Git repo, you can do whatever you want, whenever you want. And when I mean whenever, it's before, after the Terraform init plan apply, destroy success, error, and some other great places. We see a lot of Chef, Puppet, Ansible, KubeCTL, AWS, and other CLIs Bash, Python, PowerShell for the Windows oriented, that eventually the user can create a new environment from scratch and later on update those, uh, those environments. So that's how you create a new environment and you can see the policies that we have here. So very unique for the on-demand environments is the TTL policy because it's easy to request resources, but usually those developers or QA or sales engineers for demos or whatever, need eventually to destroy those resources. So we have the concept of default and maximum time to live policies, okay? So you can have the flexibility of self-service for the developers and also to give them the flexibility to extend it, but up to a maximum. And you cannot create more than the maximum unless you are, a, you are an admin. So that's one thing about the TTL policies. And the other thing, is our hierarchy of variables that we found very useful. So we have four layers of uh, places to put variables. We have global for the organization, per Git repo template, per project, and specific for environment. And we can simplify, if needed, with a drop-down list, the, the, the options, allow the options for variables values for the user. We have the option to whether to deploy all the way or to stop after the plan. So let's just click here that we want to apply all the way uh, to the actual deployment. So while this be, is being created, let's look at an already existing environment and understand how we manage existing environments. Okay, so this is an existing environment. Uh, the, the person who wrote the template can define what are the outputs which are exposed to the users in order to access the resources, but we also automatically provide interesting information. Like we parse the state so we understand all of the resources that were, were created, the last logs, the, the, the recent logs, all of the deployment history, the variables values that they were used, the number of resources in that workspace, and something very unique for N0, our cost. We do actual 
cost over time and add tags. Okay, if you look at our deployments, there is a step, it's optional, but if you decide to do so, it will execute TerraTag. TerraTag is an open source, you can check it in our GitHub. It's an open source to inject tags recursively in Terraform code. We support the main three vendors, providers, AWS, Azure, and Google. So that injects those tags. We understand which tags in those providers are taggable, which are not taggable. So you don't just have the orange line, you also have the vertical green lines that correlate a deployment to the cost. So you can isolate and understand that this was a bad deployment that increased the cost, this was a neutral deployment, and this was a great deployment that reduced the cost. And you can easily understand from each deployment what happened and what uh, affected that cost. Because if you look at the plan, you will see that uh, there is a good reason why this uh, affected the cost, because the, the, the resource here changed from, uh, from small to medium. Four minutes. That's true. So that's, that's our cost capabilities, which is super helpful. And in addition to a TTL policy, we have scheduling. So if you need to destroy those in nights and weekends to reduce cost, maybe start those automatically on Monday mornings, you can do that as well. So now let's talk about how you update an environment. Okay. So to update an environment, you click redeploy or everything you see here is using API or CLI as well. You can just get the latest code. You can change the code that it's based on. You can change the variable values. And uh, as HashiCorp has a uh, GitOps with uh, SCM integration. So you can redeploy automatically on push. You see the plans on pull request in your source control like GitHub. And you can filter, it depends on if you're monorepo or not monorepo and some folders. So you can understand, you can tell us if you want that for every change, every git push to that repo or just on the relevant, on the relevant sort of folder. So that's how you update an existing environment. A few more interesting things. So that's an environment that we created like four minutes ago. It will be destroyed automatically in uh, 12 hours before it's going to be destroyed. Uh, the user will get a notification. We have email support, Slack support. Uh, soon we're gonna have Microsoft Teams support. So they're gonna get a notification in advance. Listen, your environment is going to be destroyed. You need an extension and they can extend it if they want. So that's a very useful use case for uh, developers to have their environments, not forgetting them for too long time, but to still have control on whenever they, they wanna run it. A few more things worth uh, showing. So the approval flow. Okay, so if you have something waiting for approval, you get notification. It also uh, presented in a, in, a, in a dedicated facet of uh, needs attention uh, environments. So if you look at those environments, you will see that you need to make a decision. Deployer can make a decision whether or not to deploy it, yes or not. And if you have several pending, we manage that in a queue. I will not go over policy as code, but all in all, we are integrated with OPA. Uh, so that's our way to do policy as code and um, you know open standard non-vendor locking you can take your opa code later on if you don't want to use m0 and use uh, your jenkins or scalar or spacelift or whoever wants to support that few more things we want to add more capabilities about the managed self-service uh, so you will want to add limits on what our users can do now we have environments limits so you can set no more than three environments per user per project we want to add budget limits that's in our roadmap because we have the actual cost so we can prevent deployments if they exceed $200 per month per user, $500 per month per uh, team. Uh, obviously we support teams and uh, $1,000 per, per project. So we have the concept of budget One limits. We already have the data. So we want to do to add those limits. I'm pretty much done here. I want to add that we support SAML uh, by the way, from our, uh, you know, free or not free, just the, 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 the regular paid tiers. So you can use it uh, very, you know, in, in, in SMBs, you can use our, you can use our SAML, no uh, SAML tax, uh, SOC2 as well. And uh, we have unlimited concurrent runs on all of our tiers, including our free tier. So that's our story. One last thing, if you like it, please follow us uh, on M0 and my personal Twitter handle, DevOps Ohad. Thank you very much.
That was great, Ohad. Really, uh, really compelling solution there. I'm, I'm excited that you uh, presented that. So uh, yeah, next up we got Sebastian. Uh, Sebastian is the CEO of Scalar. Um, let's see here. Wait, uh, Ohad, uh, are you still sharing? Can you uh, stop sharing? Does everyone see my screen? Wait. I see a big Scalar. All right, awesome. All right, so yeah. Uh, next up, we got Sebastian. Sebastian is the CEO of Scalar. Uh, I've known Sebastian for many years now. Uh, back, <laughs> yeah. Back, yeah, back when he founded Scalar in the early days of AWS, some of you might remember a company called RightScale. They were in that category, a uh, competitor to them. Uh, they just launched their newest platform built from the ground up for Terraform automation and collaboration, maybe other things. Uh, he's going to highlight some of the things that really make them stand out. So Sebastian, you want to take it from here? Yeah, you bet. Uh, first of all, uh, Jake, I uh, had a uh, great job. Uh, you guys did a great job presenting, um, built some really cool, uh, cool technology. So super, super exciting to see this, uh, the, the whole market take off. And, um, and really, like, really what, what, what this is all about is just making sure people don't roll their own solutions. Uh, so um, just wanted to just wanted to throw that out there. Um, you can, uh, so just uh, first of all, I'm Sebastian, I'm the CEO and founder of the, uh, uh, co-founder of the company. Uh, joining me is, uh, is Ryan, uh, he's our uh, director for solutions engineering. And, um, and uh, if you uh, want to contact us, uh, you can see our uh, email right there. All right, so a little bit about why we, uh, we built Scalar. Um, we, we built Scalar because we wanted to make it easier to collaborate in the company around a Terraform-centric uh, approach to, to infrastructure. We uh, we didn't we didn't want to make take a pipeline approach like some of the good folks here uh, because because honestly who, who wants to uh, like really uh, who wants to maintain multiple CI/CDs um, and and what you know it, it raises all like when you want to do that it raises all sorts of problems on like what happens if you have some dev teams that want to use GitHub Actions or that want to use GitLab's workflow tools or or, or any of those things. Um, so we didn't want, want to put folks in a bad cop position to have to prosecute teammates that, uh, to get them to stop using their CICD, et cetera. Um, and it really didn't seem right to us to have to, um, uh, to have to have a pipeline for your application code, to have a different pipeline for your application code. And um, uh, it just uh, like in our experience, it just makes it harder for to get your application devs to own their own infrastructure code if you kind of, if you separate those. Um, in addition to that, we uh, we wanted to make it easier for uh, for everyone to, uh, for everyone else in an organization to use Terraform. Uh, so think think the folks that are not developers, folks that are developers but not don't, don't care to learn how to use Terraform. Uh, wanted to make it easier for those folks to use uh, to use Terraform and to deploy info infra, um, and also uh, do that without having that one guy that knows Terraform that everyone depends on to uh, to deploy or edit stuff, and that becomes a bottleneck in the organization. Um, in addition to that, we, uh, we also recognize that using the CLI is great. Uh, we want to uh, maintain that as part of the workflow. We uh, recognize that in some organizations and some teams, it's an entrenched behavior. So it's kind of something you can't, can't really part with. Um, and, and just using the CLI uh, keeps you agile when debugging, iterating on your, uh, on your code. Uh, but we did want to have access controls and policy um, um, while using the CLI and not creating a separate path for that. So like, that's what led us to create um, a, a remote operations backend. Um, and then like in addition to that, like a couple last points, we wanted there to be uh, an open source foundation to policy as code. Uh, so we took the, uh, the OPA path that, um, that, uh, that just was a natural choice for us. Um, and then the, uh, and the, one of the most important things is we wanted the, uh, the solutions to be affordable and stay affordable even as you grow. So we have got super transparent pricing, all that. You can just uh, go online to, uh, to check it out. Um, so there wasn't anything that fit all those criteria on the market. So we rolled up uh, our sleeves, got to work. And, uh, and I'd like to hand things over now to Ryan, who is going to um, share some of the stuff, stuff that we built. Oh, on mute. Okay. Thanks, Sebastian. So what I want to talk to you quickly about today and, and have a brief demo is going to talk about some of the most common use cases that we see from our customers. Um, so the first use case that we normally see when customers come to us, they say they've already got an existing CI CD uh, process in place. They're already using Terraform open source, um, but they need to, to scale it up a bit. So what we do at Scalar, we allow you to continue to use that workflow because Scalar works with Terraform native API and CLI. Um, so using that, we easily allow for migration of state in giving you that low barrier of entry um, into scale. 
So what you're going to see here is, is that, you know, I just already ran a plan and I'm sorry, I already ran a apply. And what you can see is the standard native Terraform output that you normally expect to see with the added advantages of scalar like, like Sebastian mentioned. So in here we have the cost estimation in this case was provisioning EPC, so there was no cost. We have our open policy agent to make sure we're, we're um, abiding by compliance standards. We also have the state locking going on in the background. I didn't provide any provider credentials to this because that's all stored in Scalar or I can integrate with various things like um, Vault or any other cloud credentials um, systems. And then lastly, of course, RBAC. So I can only do exactly what um, the administrators are allowing me to. So one of the things though, is, is we understand that this is a stepping stone and most companies want to get to that GitOps approach. For the GitOps approach, we've also enabled the ability to integrate with your VCS repositories. So here you'll see uh, one of our workspace screens where I've integrated with a repository. We've set up that GitOps approach and I'm able to do you know, the dry runs, the testing, everything that I need to do um, prior to, to maybe merging something in, in, in master and really implementing that, that automated testing through VCS. The key in this use case, the key in this use case is really giving our customers options whether they want to use the CLI, the VCS approach, um, or the or the API. The next use case that I want to talk about is our, our our module registry and our template registry, and this really focuses around standardization, centralization, avoiding potentially breaking changes. So, Scalar, we've created a module registry, and as you can see here, the module registry has a couple different colors here, and that represents what we call scopes. You can create modules at what we call a scalar scope, count scope, or environment scope following our, our hierarchical inheritance model. So for example, here, if I look at this one module registry as an end user, I've automatically inherited this. I can grab the source code for the VPC, but I can't remove it. I can't change it. I can't pin versions. I'm getting exactly what that administrator wants me to have. We also have then a template registry. The template registry really you can think of as something that is for two types of users maybe a, a potentially somebody that has a, a skills gap in, in terms of Terraform and is not up to speed on it, but you're standardized on Terraform as your way to provision, or somebody that really knows Terraform well already and wants an easy way to onboard a workspace or that configuration file. So we're pulling in from the VCS providers, Terraform configuration files, and making it easy for your end users to be able to provision directly from this service catalog look and feel. And at the, at the, uh, the end result is then you're getting a is this is coming through the scalar pipeline and we're checking costs, we're checking the policies, doing everything you normally expect out of this. Again, this really is both, both of these features are following our, our hierarchical inheritance. So the idea behind that is as an administrator, you might want to enforce module registry across all of your various environments and environments in scalar. Um, every application team can have an environment and you wanna make sure that they're, they're following standards, but you don't want that additional overhead of having to go into every single one of these environments and, and create that registry. So that's where I, I now jump up to what we call the account level, where I can create those modules, where I can create the template registry and automatically have those pushed down to all of my environments. The third use case is really somebody's coming to us. They're, you know, they don't have many issues with Terraform. Everything's pretty much working at scale, but they want to get to the point where uh, they want to use policy as code. They want to be more compliant or potentially improve an inefficient PR process. So in this case, as, as Sebastian mentioned, we've settled on um, or we've standardized on open policy agent, being that it's open source, can be used across the ecosystem, really grew up in the Kubernetes uh, community, as most of you know. We wanted to go with OPA. And one of the really cool things that we did with OPA is, is not only we do we see as an administrator or as an environment admin, the you know what is going on in your current environment, but what we also have implemented is the ability to preview what's going to happen with policies that are currently um, have a PR in them. So I want to know if I implement this policy tomorrow, what is going to happen to all those workspaces as soon as I implement it? Am I going to break everything? What's that, that blast radius? So these po group policy checks that we have here basically is looking at all the workspaces, all the environments across my account. And if I was to merge this to master today, it's going to tell me exactly what's going to happen. This gives me the ability to go out, contact the workspace owners, um, let them know that you know something not, might not be compliant anymore, or it gives me the opportunity as the administrator to ensure that my policy isn't going to kind of blow up production. So some of those those are the, the three use cases that we really wanted to focus on. One Again, minute, just just, uh, just to recap. So you might already have your CI/CD process in place where you're using that native Terraform open source um, command line and, and want to just scale that. 
Uh, you might want to standardize and centralize, avoid breaking changes using our module registry, a template registry, and then lastly, bring compliance um, to your workflow using our open policy agent integration. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. All right, Ryan, that was great. Thank you, Sebastian and Ryan, for uh, presenting uh, how you guys are solving yeah, that for uh, enterprises. So next up, we got uh, Spacelift. So Spacelift, uh, from Spacelift, we have Marcin. He's, or Marcin, as I've learned how to say it. Uh, he's the CEO of Spacelift. They have an impressive platform uh, built from years of experience running Terraform. Uh, from what I've witnessed so far, uh, they're doing a lot of things very well. So, Martin, uh, why don't you show everyone what you got? I'm afraid I can't start screen sharing because someone right. else is screen sharing. It should work now. Okay. Um, let, me, uh... let me find. Uh... There we go. Perfect. So, hello. Uh, we're Space Lift. My name is Martin. I'm the CEO and co-founder. I'm a former SRE in production engineering from Google and Facebook. And after my couple of years there, I was mostly doing uh, consultancy work for scale-ups and hyperscales and DevOps and cloud uh, space. The space was originally built to scratch my own itch back, back in 2017, 2018 and evolved into a, into a SaaS product. Uh, it is similar to um, some of the other tools that we've seen here. That's probably why we were invited. Uh, we do automate Terraform testing and deployment. And like most everyone here, we're mainly driven by Git events. So push, tag, pull request. So we're mainly a GitOps platform. Structurally, we're most similar to Terraform Cloud, except what they call workspaces. We call stacks in in a nod to cloud formation that did it in 2010 or Pulumi does it these days but uh, other than that we're very very similar to tar from cloud in, in the sense of, of the workflow um, however unlike uh, unlike tar from cloud but like scalar we use uh, opa and, and rego for policies similar to scalar and tar from cloud we offer a private module registry Except on top of that, we also give you a built-in CI CD that you can use to verify your uh, your modules are correct. Um, well, we position ourselves, uh, so that would be mostly again, uh, mostly differences, is we try to be the most flexible tool out there. What it means is that we hope that you, whatever you've built in-house already, but be that in Jenkins or, or some other CI platform, some, uh, some scripts that you have around your deployments, should work with either zero or minimal um, porting over to our environment. The other thing we did is we took the policy as code to a, a new level and policies are a first class citizen of the space of platform in the way that I hope to present to you. Um, third, we took a stab at workflow management uh, somewhat differently than Terraform uh, Cloud did, but we actually used policies for that as well, uh, which I hope to show you in, in a moment. Um, we also not just a Terraform shop anymore. We, um, as of last week, we're officially supporting Pulumi as our second um, first class backend, and we also support Terraform CDKs. Um, also, what we aim for is, is the simplest onboarding uh, procedure, especially if you use GitHub. We have a GitHub app that basically sets up pretty much everything for you. So you're, you're able to start with like 10, 15 minutes. So on, on the point of flexibility, uh, every job in Spacelift executes in a Docker container built from an image or started from an image that you can bring. Um, so over here, we see that someone brought in a Pulumi closure script uh, image and we basically executed a, um, a Pulumi workflow from it. That means that you can bring whatever programming uh, environment, whatever tooling you have, whatever scripts you've built so far, they will work with, uh, with Spacelift if you just point us to the right image. The second thing that adds to this flexibility is similar to, to what, uh, what the guy for, guys at M0 do, we allow you to inject custom scripts in, in certain parts of the flow. So over here, what you can see 
is uh, we're actually going through SOC 2, uh, type 2 compliance with, with a tool called Vanta. And as a part of it, we implemented TFSEC on everything that we do. Now, the way we did it is basically we're, we're downloading the newest version we're, we're, and we're executing a TFSEC before the initialization, which means that if TFSEC fails, then we're not even running anything. But that would allow you to build execute anything that is in your Docker image. It allows you to curl things. It allows you to pre-generate Terraform from a CDK or from scripts that you have. So it is a very, very compelling and very flexible approach. Um, similar to Terraform Cloud also, we allow you to set up agents on your own environment. These will talk to our um, MQTT broker, uh, but otherwise the, the whole conversation is encrypted with your private key. Um, we have no access to whatever you do with, with Spacelook. We have no access to your infrastructure. You can host things in, inside your VPC. You can host things inside your data center and uh, Spacelook will happily work with, uh, with your agent. Um, in terms of state management, we do provide a state or from state backend uh, if, if you need us to. It's actually glorified, encrypted, well-maintained S3 bucket. Uh, but we don't have to. So all of the functionality, all of the analytical functionalities, everything that we do for you is completely independent of what state backend you use. You could be using Atlas, you could be using S3, anything is, is good. If you want to bring an existing state, we're happy with that as well. We can, we can manage it for you. With regards to policies, we went like way way out of, of the, the the usual approach where you know policy would just be applied to terraform in our case it's applied to a lot of decision points within the application so for example you can build sophisticated access controls using policies there are two examples here one is kind of uh, you know done for shits and giggles uh, called admin roulette so the the sophistication of it is if you, you become an admin if you log in on a day that starts the same letter as your login. Uh, yes, you can do it with Spacelift. It's probably not advisable in production environment, but you can do it with Spacelift. So, so that's the level of, of sophistication you can achieve. Four also, minutes. You look at your IP address and, and you know, decide whether you're in the office or not. We also allow you to customize your Git flow because we, we react to Git events. Uh, we're able to... Um, react to various Git events differently. So you're able to work with monorepos and ignore certain changes. Um, we also built an IDE, which allows you to capture certain policy evaluations because we realized they're central to Spacelift. So you, you're able to capture them and then replay your policy and work with your policy until it meets your criteria. Um, we also took a stab at workflow management with something called a trigger policy. And the trigger policy basically is able to look at the changes to your stacks and then determine which stacks depend on those stacks. And we let you determine that, but we give you a lot of data to, to make that decision, including the things that have changed in your stack. So it's, it's, like, it's almost like React JS for Terraform. And policies love labels. We, we added those little selectors that you can apply on stacks, and then you can use them in policies to declare whatever uh, dependencies you, you want and whatever rules you want. Uh, as I said, we do Pulumi support. We actually support everything with regards to Pulumi. We don't provide a Pulumi backend, but otherwise policies will work. Both Spacelift and CodeGuard policies will work. Individual policies can cover P Terraform and Pulumi. Everything is vendor agnostic, including workflows. So you can trigger Pulumi stacks from, from Terraform stacks and vice versa. Um, we also made it very, very simple to start. There is a ter there is a Terraform starter repo that you can uh, do in 15 minutes and, and all, no cloud credentials required because it will just set up Spacelift resources programmatically. It's 10 minutes to basically see everything for yourself. 15 minutes if you like reading docs, which I usually don't. Uh, so we're happy to welcome your questions in, in, a, in, in the Slack channel, uh, happy to answer them. And this is the, the link to the starter repo again. And um, thank you, Eric. Thank you very much for having us here. You actually have uh, more time. If uh, are you hiring? Any other announcements you want to make? Because uh, you're gonna... obviously hiring. We're yeah. obviously hiring. Spacelift is free to free to try. Um, so there's there's no limit to you know whatever functionality we've got. Um, everything you get with Spacelift, you get out of the box, including like you know SAML, which is built in even for free accounts. You get. Uh, 
Terraform private market registry for free, including CI CD. And uh, for, for the time being, it, it's just a matter of you signing up with your GitHub account and, and trying. All right, that sounds okay. good. You got one minute if you want to use it. Otherwise, uh, we can move right into Q&A. Happy to move into Q&A. Thank you. All right, awesome. I think we got a lot of uh, questions uh, from the audience that we want to answer. Uh, before we get into them, I just wanted to uh, lay more ground rules on this. Please remember to try and keep your questions brief and to the point, since I'm sure many of you have something to ask. Uh, we're going to start by reviewing the questions in the Office Hours Slack channel and then move on to any live questions that you guys might have. Um, if we read your question, please feel free to unmute yourself uh, so we can uh, get your uh, context here. So I'm moving, oops, why is this? Gonna get that out, gonna move my Slack. Uh, gotta get this out of full screen mode here. There we go. And you guys see my uh, Slack? All right, so let's scroll up here. Sorry for all the automatic notifications. I'll probably do something about that shortly. That's a problem with automation. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let's see here. So Zach posts something here. It does not look like a question. Going to move on here. Uh, Le Leah, uh, or Leah asks, uh, Hi, Eric, Sebastian, Jake, and Ohad. I'm working as an SRE in an online education platform. I'm about to migrate uh, current on-prem infrastructure into AWS. I work with, I've work i worked with Terraform since 0.12. I like the way that Terragrun organizes Terraform in a more structured way. I'm about to present an automatic deployment pipeline solution to the company based on Terraform, Terragrun, um, along with Atlantis. I've already implemented EKS, Kubernetes, and infrastructure as code deployments. What do you think? Am I on the right track? What do you suggest after Terraform 0.13? Uh, etc. So there's been a few responses to that. Uh, I guess my the, what I think we should pr uh, scope this to is maybe some of the vendors if you want to answer like Atlantis is a great tool, but why might you not want to use Atlantis? Uh, any of you want to uh, chime in on that? Uh, you know, again, I, I sort of put this in here. I don't know that Atlantis is dead, and I'm not actually sure what uh, what Luke is doing. Both Luke and Mishra actually work for HashiCorp now, um, and a lot of the work that they've done for Atlantis has um, has certainly influenced some of the work that we've done with Terraform Cloud. So, um, again, I you know, I back to what I said inside of this is I would focus on what the workflow objectives are versus. Um, just looking at a, a, a set of tools. And what we typically find is once people sort of identify what the idealized workflow is and sort of the strength of weaknesses in there and then map that into the tools that actually provide you with that. So and whether it's Terraform Cloud or any of the rest of the vendor tools that are here, um, it, we, again, we, we sort of focus on the workflows first and then map that into the tools second versus going the other way around. Uh, Jake, do you know anything um... And you, I mean, obviously you can only say what, what is public or what you can, uh, but uh, obviously a lot of users do use Terragrunt. Um, is, uh, is HashiCorp addressing that in some way? Do you know with Terraform Cloud or uh, not at this time? Or uh, you can't I, comment? <laughs> I guess specifically what, uh, what it is objectively that people are trying to do. So um, somebody else commented in another thread about trying to make sure that your Terraform code is dry. And so a lot of the work that's going on with uh, both Terraform, the um, open source version, as well as what's happening in the cloud is to enable folks to have more dry um, type Terraform code. And so I think that's an overarching theme that we've heard from the community. And, and you know, it's not to say don't use Terragrun. Um, there's, there's certainly a reason for that. But again, back to the workflows, like what's the strengths and weaknesses of what Terragrun provides for you? And if one of the other tools doesn't provide that, then absolutely use the one that's going to make the most sense for you. Um, but Again, I think it, we'll, we'll, what we see in general is that when the community um, sort of uh, gloms onto a particular set of features or um, capabilities, those are the things that we're developing towards. And of course, uh, traction is largely gained by you know how many of our customers are asking for those features. Yeah, um, just a uh, yes, um, and just to second that with a with an additional perspective, a lot of the problems that Terragrunt set out to solve. Um, were problems at the time because there was no Terraform Cloud or there was no Scalar or there was no Taco um, like many years ago. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, uh, and so Terragrunt um, was created to solve some of those problems. Since then, uh, now that we've got so many Tacos to choose from, 
a lot of the problems that, uh, or, or like, if not most of the problems that uh, Terra Ground solves have, have been solved better in other ways. Really good point. All right. Um, there was a follow up question to that, but let's uh, get some questions from other people. And if there's nothing else, I'll get back to this one here. Uh, uh, Troy asks, does N0 support Bitbucket? Um, and uh, you, you mentioned Troy or Tim mentions that it supports any Git provider. Uh, when we open, I know a lot of uh, people use Bitbucket and GitLab. What's the overall support uh, across your platforms for these uh, VCS solutions? Well, I can start at space lifts. Um, so we obviously support GitHub and we support uh, both managed and self-hosted GitLab with Bitbuckets on, on the horizon. Cool. Yeah, then at Scalar, we support uh, GitHub, uh, GitHub Enterprise, GitLab, on-prem, main cloud, uh, Bitbucket, as well as um, Azure DevOps. So in NM0, we have two, two types of how we support Git repos. We have the standard concept that we support all Git repos, even Gerrit and every crazy new uh, Git repo. So you can deploy whatever you want with your, uh, with your Git repo. Regarding uh, support for pull request and GitOps, we now support GitHub and soon gonna support uh, GitLab and then continue to the others. Yeah, and on the on the Terraform Cloud side, uh, Azure DevOps, uh, GitHub, GitLab, uh, and Bitbucket, and the enterprise versions of uh, of each of those. Well, I don't know if there's an ADO enterprise, but <laughs> but all the rest of them we support. All right, so I'm going to uh, move on to another question here. Matt Gowie asks of Spacelift, but I think any, any vendor who wants to chime in can uh, pick this up as well. Uh, can you cover pricing details? How are these products priced? Um, and do you offer free trials? Yeah, so uh, at end of zero, we have uh, several, uh, several tiers. Uh, I briefly displayed that earlier. So we have a free tier with unlimited concurrent runs, but for low volume of uh, workspaces, environments, and, and users. And the other tiers of, we call it Pro, it depends on the, the usage. And the Pro, which starts at $99 a month, uh, accommodates uh, SAML, for example. So you get SAML even if you are a small account with $99 a month. And we have the enterprise tier with uh, the unlimited and custom number of uh, you know, uh, environments and users and uh, like uh, high priority support. Sebastian, do you want to cover this? And Sebastian, you've, uh, I remember you did a post a while back uh, studying this a lot. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so sorry, I was, uh, I was answering on Slack. What was the question again? Oh, uh, kind of, what is Scalar's pricing uh, model? Or um, do you offer free so trials? Um, yeah, so uh, we've got uh, SaaS and on-prem available. Um, the uh, uh, SaaS is priced to per seat uh, with, uh, with additional fees per concurrent run. Um, super standard there. It's, uh, it's great to see Marcin, uh, Martin as well and Spacelift adopting that model. So I think, it, I think uh, it's, it's going to be nice and easy to compare pricing for, for all the different vendors if everyone consolidates on per seat and per concurrent run pricing. Um, and then for on-prem, it's based on uh, based on it's per workspace, and it's uh, just a simple forty dollars per month per workspace. All right, uh, Jake or um, any or anyone else want to? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll put some of the links to the pricing page, but uh, very okay. similar kind of pricing models. Uh, uh, Terraform Cloud is priced uh, by the amount of admin users that we have in the system. Um, that's not a, actually the amount of consumers that you have. It's really just the folks who are doing the administration of the system itself. Uh, so some of your end users may may not get charged for uh, for what they're using, depending on what they're doing there. Um, and when you start getting into business class tiers, uh, concurrent runs, and actually the amount of successful applies um, that are um, run against the system are how we charge for things. Um, interestingly enough, uh, we 
landed on the pricing models based off from data analysis that we did on the way that um, folks are actually using Terraform Cloud. And so um, that's a, a feedback loop that we use consistently based off from the massive amount of data that we have from, um, from users. Uh, we looked at a couple different pricing models like resources under management and workspaces and things like that, which Terraform Enterprise uses. Um, and we landed on uh, successful applies, concurrent runs, and the users based off from that data. Cool, thanks for that context, uh, Jake. So uh, Dave asks a really good question, I think. Um, what, uh, what's, uh, what is it looking like for getting these tools to be certified for use by the various gov clouds? Is that something uh, all of you have looked into? Somewhat. Um, yeah, so I mean, it depends on, on, on lots of different factors. Um, depending on the size and uh, size of your deployment and, and, and all that, I, I'd recommend starting with self-managed so you can be uh, so you reduce the scope of, uh, of what compliance is, um, and then, but then after that, there's a whole bunch of options from from Prisma to, Prisma to FedRAMP. Um, so, um, yeah, that's a that's a whole hour long conversation in itself. All right. I'm not actually sure what I can talk about, to be honest with you. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, yeah, if uh, you know, if there's work in that area, I'm sure uh, you'll see you'll see it sometime soon. Yeah. Uh, Ohad, anything from M Zero? No, uh, that's not uh, the customers that we are uh, talking with uh, at the moment. Uh, it's it's uh, later on for us. Um, yeah, it, but it, it, uh, if it's something that uh, if it's something that's uh, of interest to more folks, so ha happy to uh, like maybe we should like we could take that offline as well. But uh, like we we've got both NASA and the Food and Drug Administration that, that use Scalar, um, and uh, happy to connect uh, with uh, with those folks uh, for conversations on how to how to deploy into Gov Cloud and how to manage that. So Andrew Roth asks a good question here. Uh, which of the, these four solutions can be run on premise and which ones can be run on premise in a disconnected environment? I'm guessing you mean like air gapped kind of like not with uh, internet connectivity. Yep. Yes. Cool. I think all of them, right? Jake, yes. I think uh, like TF TFE is uh, able to be com completely air gapped, right? Yeah, so uh, Terraform Enterprise has both an online and a um, air gapped install. Um, it, but it's it's a you know it's it's different than Terraform Cloud, but it is a self there is a self hosted version of it. Yeah, so Scalar can be run in an air gap. It is you no, know, we have customers run it in an air gapped environment. Oh, uh, we are not air gapped yet, uh, but we can be run uh, on premise, but not air gapped. Um, with Spacelift, we're, we don't run on-premise and we'll try to avoid doing it. All right. Well, that's uh, really helpful. So uh, Troy asks, uh, if I understand Scalar works with Terraform Cli, uh, if that's the case, since uh, TerraGrunt wraps the Terraform Cli, can Scalar work with TerraGrunt? Short answer, yes. Longer answer, Ryan, Ryan you want to tackle that one? <laughs> well, yeah, so so we're really integrating with the native Terraform CLI. Um, it, it, there's components that potentially, but in general, it's really you would you would be having to use the actual Terraform CLI itself, not necessarily Terragrunt to be working with with Scalar. All right. There was one question uh going back to leah's uh one here and, and i wanted to bring that up so you know there's a lot of interest these days with like kubernetes native tools more we're talking like we flux argo cd go cd etc um how what's your guys's position on using your tools for continuous delivery to kubernetes do you feel like you know, uh, you're the best things since sliced bread. Are the better options, or you know, what? Uh, what's your take? Um, I can speak for Spacelift um, and say that we wouldn't probably use Terraform to deploy applications to Kubernetes. We would probably use a dedicated tool. That said, we would definitely consider adding like a specialized tool as a as a backend for ourselves to be able to 
um, to deploy to Kubernetes uh, directly. Um, so the one reason why I wouldn't use Terraform to deploy anything as, as an application is, is the, the inability to do transactionality. So especially if you're deploying multiple services at the same time, what we've done ourselves is we, we use that cloud formation for the last mile, but there's a lot of like, if you're deploying to Kubernetes, there's a lot of lovely tools out there and Terraform is probably not, not the best thing out there. It's just a private opinion. Uh, for us, uh, we we just you know want to provide value for, for the customers. So it really depends on what the customer believes in. Uh, we have customers that use the uh, the Terraform provider to deploy uh, namespaces and uh, and pods. Uh, we have others that use other tools, other CLIs, uh, stuff like that in our custom flows in our N0 YAML. So we 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 don't have a strong opinion. We just want to support all the options and give the customers the option to run whatever they believe in. Yeah, and at Scalar, I think we're we're in the same boat where we don't necessarily have uh, one opinion one way or the other. If you have a, a CI CD workflow that works great for you now using native CLI, go for it. If you want to get into more GitOps and more VCS, um, absolutely do it. And that's, that's really the approach we want is make sure that there's a low barrier to entry. We're not overly prescriptive on the way that you have to implement your CI CD process, um, whatever is best for you. And, and we try to make that flexible for you. So uh, one question I have then, uh, and I think uh, this is one of, something that maybe stands out with uh, HashiCorp and their uh, platform is that they're building out other hosted or managed products. Um, I think uh, Vault has been announced and uh, other ones. Uh, Jake, first of all, what are the other products that are coming out as part of the HashiCorp cloud? And for the other vendors, do you see any similarity with this? Are, are there other things that you think you're going to manage uh, as well, or is it just going to be automation? Yeah, so uh, I, I think most people could probably imagine that anything that we have self-hosted will probably end up on the HashiCorp Cloud Platform. Uh, console was the first. Uh, we released it in Azure first um, with a great deal with Microsoft. It's in public beta in, in AWS right now and should be GA, I think, in probably about a month or so. Um, HashiCorp uh, Vault is in private beta right now, public beta probably also opening up um, sometime in the next month or so. And then it's, you know, again, I would expect to see something like Nomad. I haven't I personally heard any dedication to that, but I'd be really surprised if we don't see Nomad um, show up in the cloud as well. And so that, that covers the, the top four. Um, and then I'm not really sure what the plans are for like boundary or waypoints in the future, um, uh, but uh, uh, you know, very real possibility those will probably end up in the cloud as well. My guess is that that'll that'll lag behind quite a quite a bit. Yeah, on the uh, on the scalar side, we're uh, we're you know huge fans of uh, all the HashiCorp uh, open source products, uh, but we're staying laser focused on the Terraform side. Uh, we do not have any plans to do Pulumi or any of the. Um, any of the cloud formation, just, just laser focused on making the Terraform experience great. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and that's it. Cool. Uh, so we at M0, we, we focus on infrastructure as code, not on things like uh, Vault and other uh, other solutions. And as I mentioned, we now support Terragant and we do plan to add uh, more uh, more frameworks. And it's great to see Martin and, and Spacelift that started with, uh, with Pulumi. Uh, I think customers, uh, you know, the, a few years ago, uh, the, the concept of multi-cloud uh, was interesting to allow customers to have one management solution for several clouds. And I think same as Mar Martin probably that uh, to give the, the same concept of management, but for different technologies now uh, means supporting more infrastructure as code frameworks. So uh, yeah, that's, I think, Hours in space lift at least approach, but uh, sorry for saying things in the name of space lift, but it looks like <laughs> adding Pulumi, adding Pulumi proves that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, well, for us, thanks for thanks for saying things in our name. Um, so for us, we, we're definitely looking into um, adding more things. That there are some things on on a closer horizon, like cloud formation. There are things on on a farther horizon, like Ansible. 
Uh, but uh, we are definitely also looking into more specialized tools for deployments because what we realize is that there, there is an adjacency between building infrastructure and deploying application to this infrastructure. As I said before, I don't personally think that Terraform does deployments very well, but Pulumi does them better. They have a crosswalk, something called crosswalk for Kubernetes, which, which gives you a more native feel. So like it does already a decent solution that we support for, for Kubernetes. Uh, but we're also looking into, into, into other solutions that are even more uh, tailored to, to a platform that seems to have won the war. So uh, the question I have now is like, uh, all of you are about infrastructure automation. Um, and uh, to what extent can we automate your, your solutions with Terraform, for example? Uh, do you provide providers? Uh, kind of a meta question here. Can we Terraform Terraform Cloud? Can we Terraform <laughs> Scalar, et cetera? Um, yeah, answers, yes, I, as far as Scalar goes. And yes, Terraform Cloud does have a Terraform yeah. provider as well. Cool. Yeah, so I, I have to be honest, we still do not have uh, this option yet. We just have our uh, API and CLI, but it's definitely something we will do. Yeah, it really is a meta. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> and it's a yes from Spacelift. Actually, our Terraform starter repository just automates Spacelift. That's cool. So let's see here. Um, uh, any, uh, so I, 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 any questions uh, from the community in uh, Slack? I don't see any new ones here. Otherwise, I, I always got questions. I'm kind of curious to, to hear your questions, Eric. Go for it. <laughs> um, You're going to be grilled. <laughs> yeah, well, no. Well, well so I'm curious, like, uh, well, this is a hard one to come up with on the spot if you hadn't thought about it before. Uh, so only feel free to answer if, if it is there. But like, what was one of, on the engineering side, what was one of the hardest uh, challenges you had implementing automation for Terraform? Um, if, uh, if any of you have an answer for that one. Yeah, that's, you know, that's definitely a better question for my, uh, for my, uh, my, my engineering co-founder. Um, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll defer to Ohad and, and Marjan on that one. I yeah. have the exact same answer as Sebastian. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. That was uh, that was a hard one. They always laugh at me. You know, I, I, my background is technical. I I am a geek. I started a university at a young age, in parallel to high school. But in the last few years, uh, I moved to do other stuff. So I'm always a joke uh, in the company that I have no idea about <laughs> actual actual coding so uh, sorry does not uh, being able to provide uh, an answer here all right so i got a better one that i think is easier for everyone to answer one is about organization and it's a challenge that we run into at cloud posse uh doing terraform is that we end up with like hundreds of workspaces lots of environments lots of accounts um uh, and Making sense of all of that can be difficult. So, do all you know? Do all of you provide a way to organize environments uh, in that setup where, if you have lots of workspaces, you can group them? Um, and if so, uh, what what are you doing around that? So, yeah, we we have the concept of project. Okay, so in right. a project, you can manage several environments, several workspaces and it, we see that it usually makes sense to set credentials and uh, not credentials like role-based access for projects so for that's for existing cloud resources that are already provisioned and for future cloud resources that might be provisioned by users later on so we, we find the project concept very flexible and very powerful uh, in l0 yeah, at, at Scalar, that, you know, the inheritance model that I spoke about during the demo is, is really core to that. Um, so we have three different levels, or actually, I'm sorry, two different levels. We have what we call the account level, um, where you create the policies, you create your users, your RBAC, um, all of that sort of stuff. And you apply all that to what we call environments. And within those environments, those could be equal to a project team, an application, um, really whatever you want. It's going to be an environment's going to be equal to a group of workspaces that that logically makes sense to be together. Um, and then at the, the workspace level, you can then, of course, um, assign more permissions. So through that, you know, we really tackled multi-tenancy, being able to apply policies for different groups that might have different uh, needs, different requirements, et cetera, um, in that, that inheritance model. 
Yeah, in Terraform, uh, you know, we have organizations which, you know, generally speaking, are on a per customer basis for uh, uh, for this for the model. But uh, we do have customers who run multiple organizations. Um, there are some uh, some work around being able to share resources between those organizations to make that model a little bit easier. Obviously, workspaces are you know fundamental in terms of the RBAC controls of how people um, can either see or not see those things. And even just uh, you know just kind of you know silly the fact that you can search through. Um, workspaces. So, you know, if you have naming conventions that help you try to reduce the amount of strain that you see out there, um, those can also be very, very helpful for folks. Um, so um, I think, you know, it's sort of interesting. Everybody talks about the, the global variables and, and whatnot. And I think one of the hardest problems that we've had to deal with here is really in and around security. Sebastian talked about this. I think um, the, the reason we, we don't see a lot of global variables in Terraform Cloud is more because of the way that our security model works and, and that we would much rather rather have least uh, access to things versus yeah versus wide opening access. And so, um, you know, again, we're, there's a lot of work in and around that. I think the, the, the agent based way of doing um, reaching into cloud accounts using identity based um, ways of accessing the cloud based accounts helps out. Uh, but for like, you know, if you have a, a, a specific variable that's not cloud based uh, pattern is across from things can be very tough. And so again, we, we take a security first model and, and things like that. Um, but I think that's probably the, the, um, you know, sort of how we organize data is generally between workspaces, search, and RBAC. What can you guys, uh, 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 did I give, if somebody wants to add something, that's fine. Oh, uh, it's just oh. good, just, oh, multiple. Okay. Oh, I could I could talk for space lift, but I'll, I'll let Sebastian. Uh, oh, I was just gonna say, like in terms, like I'm not sure it's quite an engineering challenge, but oh my God, going through compliance, that's such a rectal exam. So like, I don't know, I don't know if it really qualifies, but. Jesus Christ, that's that, that can is be, uh, that, can that, be, counts. that can be not fun. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and we're going through that now. So, good fun. Uh, with regards to organizing workspaces, and we call them st uh, stacks, uh, we use the Kubernetes approach where you can add labels. And basically, you can use labels as selectors, both in your policies as well as in, in your GUI and, and the API, you can basically pull by by labels and labels and values. So we're we're trying to be as flexible there as possible. Cool. So uh, next question I have is, what are you guys most excited about in your industry? Like, what is the next? What like for twenty twenty one? Is there anything you can talk about that you're working on? E.g., public roadmap items or other trends or things like that. Do vaccines count? Because I'm really. <laughs> yeah. No, the I'm product has a virus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to say for N0, we're putting a lot of effort in the ephemeral per pull request on demand environments for, uh, uh, you know, that go up and down and uh, need, needs to be destroyed. And we, we see a lot of uh, governance that uh, customers ask us for, I mentioned the budget limits that we, we hear a lot, uh, limiting the, the users, because you know we, we, we sometimes talk about the move from a CapEx cloud to OPEX cloud. You used to know how much you're gonna pay for cloud. Uh, obviously in the physical world before uh, VMware, you, 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 you bought machines, you bought servers, but then it moved to cloud, but it was still like EC2 instances that has uh, like a fixed price, but how much you're gonna pay for Lambda? How much you're gonna pay for other scaling group Kubernetes cluster? How much you're gonna pay for BigQuery? You don't know, it depends, it depends on the usage. So developers for sure do not know when they write the code, how much it's, uh, it's gonna cost. So to catch those problems, earlier and shift left uh, cloud cost, uh, thanks to our tagging and uh, actual cost over time correlated to deployments that increase the cost, getting alerts, and uh, maybe what New Relic did to latency, uh, I think M0 mm -hmm. is going to do some to, to cloud cost and thanks to infrastructure as code, uh, it's now possible, I think. You uh, you brought some you touched on something there that uh, reminded me and it, it is a uh, more and more common buzzword uh, for good reasons I mean but this is shift left security right moving security uh, earlier in your pipeline closer to the the code um, all of you support some form of uh, policy enforcement whether it be Sentinel OPA or similar the challenge is that we find is like that's great. 
what should I do? What should, what, what should our policies be? Are you guys providing, are, are, are all of you providing catalogs, uh, like uh, libraries to start with uh, for these policies and best practices? We, we don't do any of those. We, we do not educate our customers to best practices. They, the community knows the best. So, and the community always uh, updates its uh, recommendation for best practices. And we are not the community. We are a vendor that loves the community, but we are not the community. Yeah, I kind of second that uh, that approach from from what I had. Uh, like the innovation comes from the community. Like the, the role that I I I think we, we probably both share is like, you know, on like seeing what like what the best of the community is and 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 promoting that, uh, and making sure that great ideas spread uh, spread fast. Yeah, I mean, go ahead, go ahead, Martin. Yeah, I can I can second that, but we definitely want to support the community within within our tool. So basically, allow you to. Build a policy and share your policy with, with other people, whether that be something for I don't know, SOC two, a SOC two compliance or just your regular, uh, you know, safeguarding your IDS cluster. We, we'd like you to be able to share it through through Spacelift, and we'd like to tap into this community and help this community uh, grow together. Sounds yeah. like this community needs to step up. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, I th you know, on our end, the, the harder part is that Sentinel is, uh, is not an open source product and it's, uh, it's at the enterprise level. So um, what we've actually done is we've aggregated all of the um, Sentinel policies that a lot of our customers um, have, uh, have used. And we've turned those into the foundational policies that I shared in the links um, above uh, here earlier in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the chat room. And so um, again, we, we don't really have the, the benefits of having the community there. Possibly in the future, uh, stay tuned for that one. But um, but the idea really is that we we know for sure that there are certain patterns that all of our customers typically use when they when they use Sentinel, and we publish those. So and, and we have a couple of folks on our team uh, that actually work with our customers very uh, very closely on sort of abstracting those so that they're available to the larger um, market as well. So. So while, yeah, while yes, I mean, we, we certainly want the, the community and our customers to publish what it is that they have. We found that whatever the patterns are that are regular between those environments, those are the, those are the ones that we publish. Eric, I would maybe modify that question just a little bit. You know, sure. I'd say that, you know, with Terraform, since it's such a, a flexible tool, there's, you know, 20 different ways to do one thing. Right. Um, you know, if there is a, catalog of here's here's a bunch of of use cases that we see a lot uh and you know here's getting started guides on how to accomplish those use cases given with our tool that you know it would be something i would be very interested in yeah i that's the thing is starting to think about policies and how to express it um then one can start riffing off of that but often it's just I find it really hard uh, to take that first step and knowing uh, what, what that should be. And it's a question that's come up in Sweet Ops Slack, uh, I know a few times is like, what should our, <laughs> what policies do we need? What are the best practices? So, so uh, like, uh, to, for the, uh, the earlier question, some of the things that we're excited about, I think there's, there's yeah. two things coming out here in the next, uh, next couple of months are, uh, that we're, uh, we're pretty excited about. One is uh, self-hosted runners. Uh, making it easier for folks to uh, to get the benefits of SaaS, but still the, uh, the 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 advantage of being able to deploy things in um, in local networks. Uh, so self-hosted runners definitely definitely one, and then drift uh, nailing uh, drift detection mm -hmm. and drift remediation mm -hmm. is another thing that that uh, that's turned out to be much trickier to do. Like it's easy to do poorly. It's tr very tricky to do right. Uh, so that's something that we were, were excited to be uh, excited to release. I want to add a few more words about policies. So in addition to, to OPA, we have our own uh, proprietary policies. I mentioned time to leave policies, uh, scheduling policies, uh, environments limits that user cannot provision more than X number of workspaces of, of environments. And we, we do plan to add uh, more kind of, uh, of uh, enforcement on, and governance. 
Yeah, I think the, the themes for Terraform are very similar in nature. Um, much like what M0 is doing is that intelligence back into um, cost-based analysis. Like currently Sentinel can um, can mod, can watch your cost estimation and, and give you some intelligence there. But more on the other side of what M0 is doing is like actually giving you some um, predictive intelligence about um, what's happening, showing you a history of what's happening within uh, your workspaces, how those changes have affected both cost and any other kind of policy management that's out there. And then the other uh, stuff is really uh, definitely aimed at more of the enterprise customers. Like how do we share the information from the cloud-based platform with your existing system? So be it your monitoring systems or logging systems or anything like that. And so you don't have to instrument into Terraform Cloud to get the intelligence that you need. Um, and it, you know, again, that just kind of fits in with our workflows and our technology. We're always trying to uh, both in you know, sort of ingest uh, 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 materials for lots of other clouds, but also egress that material into lots of other tools. So um, you get the the, the proper intelligence that you need. I think those are kind of the major overarching themes I would say um, are we're focused on right now. And then scalability, you know, we're onboarding so many users, just making sure that the platform is scaling <laughs> or what uh, the user requests of thousands of users a month that we're getting. I can only imagine what that looks like uh, on the back end. Well, thank you so much everyone for presenting today we are about out of time here so uh, that ends our special segment here of cloud posse's office hours i want to thank all the speakers who've come to us from around the world and took the time to show us what they're building like yeah really uh, great job guys that that was awesome i think this is going to be an epic uh epic recording we'll follow up soon with an email including a link to this recording so you can share that with your team as well as some links to follow up with the vendors uh, all of them would love to hear from you i'm sure uh, and get you started kicking the tires. So uh, next we got, uh, you know, I just want to make sure everyone knows that you can register for these live office hours sessions. They happen every week. Just go to cloudposse.com slash office hours. If you ever want to book a session with Cloud Posse to learn how we can accelerate your DevOps, go to cloudposse.com slash quiz. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash quiz. A recording of this call will be posted to our YouTube channel and syndicated to our podcast at podcast.cloudposse.com. See you all next week. Same place, same time. Thanks, Eric. Great job. Thank, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> all right. Well, Take care. All right. Have a great, have a great week.